Hey, let's talk about how we can potentially identify Bitcoin ransomware in real time so that way we can hack the hackers. So we want to know Bitcoin is going through the roof. It's a decentralized currency, so trust is kind of hard to come by. The more ransomware that happens, the worse it looks, the lower uh, the trust in the system. So we want to know, can we start identifying these um, negative events in real time? And then knowing kind of which type of ransomware attack it is doesn't really add any value. Montreal Comrade Circle, like what, what even is that? So we're just going to do binary. Is it a ransomware attack or not? So to do this, we need to acquire some data. This data set is brought, brought to me by UCI. Um, they host a, a Bitcoin heist ransomware data set. It's from the full Bitcoin graph from 2009 up until 2018 <clears throat> with um, transactions lower than uh, 0.3 Bitcoins filtered out. It's a heavily imbalanced data set, which is fairly typical of fraud data. So there's only you know, 1.4% of the actual records are what we're trying to find. So it's that kind of needle in the haystack problem. There's, it's a large data set, especially for a you know, single computer processing, which hurts uh, being able to iterate quickly on. So it's 3 million records and then 40,000 of those are ransomware. <clears throat> so the actual data itself, a lot of the, the columns are, are quantitative columns, including count, which is a, a daily count of the number of um, transactions on that wallet. So they're heavily right tailed, which kind of adds some, some noise to it. It's not really distinguishable between the ransomware and normal that right tailed node. So there's, there's certainly a lot of noise in this data. Um, the data itself comes from UCI, so it's fairly clean. There's no missing values, which is great. Almost all the columns are numeric, except for the timestamp data, which we're going to drop anyways to avoid some data leakage. Um, there's, it's only based off of, I think, three, three actual ransomware type attacks. So they certainly didn't happen all throughout 2009, 2018. And if we left in timestamp data, um, that would be data leakage since it would predict, you know, anything from 2010 isn't ransomware. And that's, that's not helpful um, to identifying ransomware tomorrow. Feature engineering, we can use those timestamps, however, to kind of make cumulative columns. So we can um, do cumulative number of transactions on that wallet, um, number of uh, income on that wallet. So, you know, total amount of Bitcoins. Um, we can also do wallet age, and then we can set a wallet age of zero. So obviously, you know, the first, first transaction that wallets ever had is their first transaction. So in order to model this, we chose two different types of, of ultimate classifiers. Um, however, to deal with the imbalance problem is kind of that first step. So we're going to resample using this non-SKLearn package called IMB Learn for imbalance learn. Um, and then we're using both uh, SMOT or undersampling, depending on what our ultimate classifier is going to be. So um, for logistic regression, uh, we'll use SMOT since um, it's going to create synthetic data points. Uh, since all of our columns are numeric, we can use SMOT, create synthetic data points in between existing data points and are only in our minority class. Um, so we can create all these points in between each other in the minority class to kind of resample up to get a larger uh, number of records in their synthetic, but you know, presumably makes sense if there is that underlying uh, relationship to then be able to compare to our majority class. In the case of random forest, we used undersampling um, because we had so much data on the random forest side that it makes it faster to kind of decrease that data volume down, especially because it's a single computer um, problem. Uh, if we had more computation power, it would be faster to iterate on random forest, which just take longer to train. Um, and it, we, we would be better, we wouldn't have that information loss if we had used smoke, but here we just use undersampling. The intermediate stages are for literature regression where you kind of do that standard, standard scalar to normalize. So it gets rid of that right tail or really squashes it down and kind of pushes it more towards the normal. And then PCA uh, helps to further compress it into just kind of the directions that's how you know PCA works is by finding those principal directions in which the data has variance kind of kind of moves so um, when we're doing a random grid search on a PCA of one component it actually makes it very fast to train because it's just a single direction within the data and then <clears throat> we're really looking at a an F2 score so you know the F1 score is that uh, harmonic mean between precision and recall. And since this is a fraud problem, you're really interested in recall. So F2 is weighting it, the F1 score, the F score, weighting it 
to more heavily uh, focus on recall. Um, recall is important here because you're looking for that needle in a haystack. So with new records, you absolutely want to make sure you get them. And the downside, obviously, is you're going to predict a lot more that are wrong. So a lot more of your predictions will, will you know, a lot more of your predictions saying this is ransomware will be incorrect. But if you, you want to make sure you capture all of the ransomware. Um, and there's a balance there between precision and recall. Recall being, you know, of the actual ransomware that comes through. How many did I get right? versus precision, which is how many did I say were ransomware were right, where we really want to make sure our recall is high, but if our precision is too low, we're just going to be saying everything is ransomware, and that's, you know, doesn't, doesn't actually provide any value. So there is a balance there to strike, and that's kind of where that F score comes in, where you then would weight it more to recall using F2. Um, so we did our randomized grid search, searching for uh, really just num trees, and <clears throat> Num trees and max depth for the random forest classifier. Um, even just with the default parameters, the random forest classifier blew logistic regression out of the water, which is kind of expected. It's certainly, uh, you know, it, it basically is fitting a bunch of overfitters and taking that aggregated uh, prediction. So, um, you know, we got even n estimators at 400. So that's certainly, like I said, random forest kind of took a lot longer to train. So you know, probably because we're using such high um, number of estimators, even that grid search, you know, the lowest number of estimators we used was 50, 50, 100, 200, 400. So um, we use class weight balance to kind of also help with the imbalance problem. But because we're doing that um, undersampling, oversampling to begin with, it wasn't super important. So here you can see that, you know, my random up undersampler, which is basically undersampling the majority class and with a simple strategy, strategy of 0.5, it does 50-50 majority to minority. <clears throat> so that class weight balance isn't actually important here, but left it in because I searched randomly across different uh, numbers of undersamplers. So our final recall was 0.81, which is, is pretty good for you know how much noise kind of is. This is a clean data set, but it's a kind of a wallet over time look. So it's pretty hard to get uh, a great number. And some of the other research papers really use this model chain, this, this wallet chaining of transactions that you know isn't captured here in this data set. Um, so a point at one recall, you know, for every you know five um, ransomware attacks that happen, we classify on in the underlying data. We're going to say four of them accurately are ransomware, which is you know that's not that's not terrible, it's not bad. The precision of point four is pretty bad, and that's a, a pretty big problem. So for you know, every 10 predictions we make say ransomware, six of them are wrong. And that's a, that's a lot of noise. But the beauty is the data itself, they even said, you know, they didn't bet the 2.8 million other records that weren't labeled as ransomware. Those were just from the graph. Those could be ransomware. So, you know, you could use this data to do a semi-supervised learning problem. So you take um, the high confidence threshold outputs you get that were wrong. Here that, that you predicted as um, you predict as ransomware, the labels actually say are, are normal transactions, and you go look at those and, and see if maybe they're actually ransomware. And if that's the case, put them back in. You can retrain. Look again at, at the the confidence threshold, the high confidence that are uh, ransomware or not, and keep going in that cycle until, until you get some kind of more data. So it's a good helper to understand. Uh, more of the data, how much is ransomware or not. Um, we could also build kind of that ransomware type classifier if we were interested in uh, what type of ransomware attack it was, especially as we kind of evolve over time, that might be useful. So you would, you know, kind of classify which ransomware style it is and then wait the more recent ones for, you know, an ongoing uh, process. And then, you know, those, those kind of tie together. So you know, hopefully we can maybe improve that precision a fair amount. Maybe the semi-supervised learning will, will help us get there and, you know, start bringing some more trust to the, to the Bitcoin world. Thanks.